Ladies and gentlemen, planet Earth has been invaded by a species of reptilian overlords that are determined to make sure that humanity never sets foot in the stars. This alien species is known as the Eddywigs. Repulsive name for them, surely enough. Hi, everybody. I'm Bill Whittle here with Steve Green and Scott Otta, and this is your right angle uh, on the elimination of human exploration of space by these cold-blooded reptilian Eddywig creatures. Now, for those of you who are wondering, the term Eddywig is actually an acronym, and it is an acronym for the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Working Group, a group of cold-blooded reptiles that are actually influencing NASA and, um, and other public policy decisions. Uh, their stated goal is basically to make sure that we don't spread our filthy genes, microbes, or capitalism anywhere outside of the planet, and they're determined to make sure that we don't do it, and they plan to, to use a rule of law in order to do it. Let me uh, read you both just a brief statement from these uh, reptilian uh, uh, aliens, um, and, and this is a direct quote from the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Working Group making their report to NASA. All of humanity is a stakeholder in how we, the planetary science and astrobiology community, engage with other worlds. Violent colonial practices and structures, genocide, land appropriation, resource extraction, environmental devastation, and more, have governed exploration on Earth, and if not actively dismantled, it will, dismit, it will define the methodologies and mindsets we carry forward into space exploration. It is critical that ethics and anti-colonial practices are a central consideration of planetary protection we must actively work to prevent capitalist extraction on other worlds, respect and preserve their environmental systems, and acknowledge the sovereignty and interconnectivity of all life. Which is quite a mouthful. Uh, uh, Steve, Angry I'll start with mouthful. you. But before I do, I'm going to institute a new procedure, which is called the pause that refreshes. I'm going to be silent. We're all going to be silent for three seconds. And during those three seconds of silence, you will be able to stop the video, hit the subscribe button located directly low, ring the bell, and not miss a single thing. So here we go. Ready? And do it now. Steve, what do you think of this ridiculous edict coming from these uh, uh, these immoral and and obnoxious creatures who have uh, determined that the one thing that we cannot do is bring colonialism to a place where there is no creature to colonize? Oh, screw these humanity hating hippies! Screw Actually, these humanity hating weenies! Yeah, that's yeah, it. What occurs to me is maybe they're not even humanity hating. Maybe they're just America hating. Simply because you know the Chinese aren't going to follow these stupid rules, so they're purposely hamstringing American institutions so that, you know, it'll be a, a Chinese flag on Mars, it'll be a Chinese flag on Alpha Centauri and all the rest instead of us. Well, I want it to be us. I, I, I want the people who invented constitutional liberty to spread that liberty everywhere we possibly can can. And if that's colonialism, call me a colonialist, please. You know, um, go back to, to just the dawn of humanity and nothing has changed. There are two kinds of people. The people who are uh, just too scared to leave the cave, who sat huddled around while the, the stronger, smarter, more ambitious people brought them food, and the people who actually went out into the world to do things and accomplish things and feed the rest of the uh, the scaredy cats back there. The problem we have today is that the scaredy cats, they're ambitious just like everybody else, but their ambition is to make themselves feel better by keeping everybody down at their level, and so they hamstring the doers with impossible rules to make it impossible to get anything done, and that's exactly what these folks are trying to do. Uh, you know, Bill, while you were... Uh, Setting this up, you made me think of I think I think it was just the movie version of Contact, the uh, the Carl Sagan novel. I, I, I can't remember if this bit was in the books. It's been a long time since I've read the book, but where uh, Ellie Arroway's father, uh, when asked if there's life out there, tells her, well, if there's not, it's an awful waste of space. Well, so far, we don't have any evidence of any life out there. It is a waste of space. Let's go fill it up. Location, location, location. Uh, uh, Steve, let me just give you a quick follow-up here sure. because um, 
as they point out, it, this this office is called the Planetary Protection Office, and it's not protecting our planet because if I was running the Planetary Protection Office, I'd be building be building giant space laser platforms and I'd be aiming them outward. Yes, but this Planetary Protection Office is designed to make sure that we don't go anywhere. Um, so, uh, you 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 will be interested to know because I know you're a, a student of these things that the last time that NASA set an experiment to detect life into space was in 1976 during the Viking landers. That was the last time that they have been allowed to send an experiment to test for life. The Planetary Protection Office has basically limited them from doing that. We could have had a confirmation of, of life on Mars or anywhere else for that matter quite a long time ago, but we're not allowed to look idea. for it anymore because that is colonialism and it's also uh, capitalism or, or resource expansion. It, it's one of those isms and nasty things that we shouldn't be. Care to comment on that? Yeah, imagine if uh, Elon Musk hired one of these committees at Tesla to tell them why uh, cars are evil and shouldn't exist and that they would be in charge of setting production policy at his big Fremont assembly plant. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Um, that is pretty much it. And you'll be pleased to know, both of you, that um, when uh, exobiologists are, are begging for an exemption of this policy, they want to do some kind of life experiments. Of course. The Planetary Protection Office has said, well, and I'm not making this up, we will allow you to conduct experiments if you can prove that there is no life there before we send you on this mission. <laughs> Because otherwise you may contaminate the life that would be there that you'd be looking for. But if you can prove without a doubt that there is no life in that location to our satisfaction, then you can go ahead and send out your experiments to see if there's life there. Uh, Scott, you would think, OK, well, this is reasonable enough. We don't want to crush the Bajorans underneath our iron boots. You know, we're, we're decent mm -hmm. people. We're not we're not we're not bad guys. This kind of thing makes sense. Protecting alien uh, civilizations, obviously, alien animals, all of these things, ecosystems even. But um, you'll be pleased to know that not only is the Planetary Protection Office going to try its very best to bar any exploration where there could even be microbes, so Mars is out, no Mars mission, it's against the law. You can't launch a Mars mission from the United States because of the Planetary Protection Office. But even the moon is out, Scott. And there are no microbes on the moon, but that doesn't matter to the uh, to the big brains uh, in 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 uh, the reptile uh, uh, organization because they say that if we were to go even if we allowed manned missions to sterile rocks like the moon that might inhibit or or alter potential evolution of microbes at some point in the future wow you know, when you were talking, I was just reminded of what is perhaps the most famous photograph in the history of the world. It's a boot print on the surface of the moon. Mm -hmm. I, I can picture the tire tracks on the surface of Mars. Uh, one of the more popular satirical things I ever did at my old uh, website was actually I photoshopped a, a, the, one of the early pictures from a Mars lander, and I photoshopped in a can of Coca-Cola that was half buried in the, in the Martian uh, red soil. <laughs> and um, we planted a flag and we left some trash on the surface of the moon. I, I am in favor of all of those things except the latter. And the reason why I don't think we should just leave trash on the surface of any other worlds that we uh, explore is because I think we should plan to be back and want the place to look nice when we get there. Yeah. So if we do have some Seems trash reasonable. that we're going to leave, uh, we should have a plan for that. And I, I'm reminded of when uh, Bob and Doug uh, arrived at the International Space Station on that uh, Demo 1 cruise on the Dragon capsule uh, from SpaceX, before they could get out of the capsule and get into the International Space Station, they actually did a whole inventory of every uh, empty bottle of water that they had, <laughs> like whatever they had consumed on the way up, and they're radioing it back and they're writing it down to the, uh, to the people at Mission Control to let them know. And I thought, wow, these people are careful about everything because yeah. when you're in space, you don't get a resupply quickly. So everything has to be carefully monitored, cat, uh, inventoried, and tracked. Um, my guess is that we won't start to see much uh, wasteful, destructive behavior during space exploration for several millennia when it gets to be such an ordinary thing that we could do what I saw in Philadelphia once where a guy was about to get onto a city bus and he had just... He was drinking from a giant 
cup of McDonald's uh, soft drink. And before he stepped on the bus, he just let go of the cup and it hit the ground. I think these people should focus more on how they're treating their own neighborhoods and their people who surround them and less on potential microbes that nobody has proven exist out there in space. Um, I think that we are going to be naturally desirous to make sure that we treat everything we do well because you know, like Elon Musk, he, he intends to live and perhaps die on Mars. He wants that place to look good. And I'll bet you that the casino he builds on Mars will be the cleanest <laughs> one in the galaxy. You actually put your finger directly on the entire motivation of this thing. And I didn't realize it until you said it, because the photograph of the boot print on the moon is so transcendental. It, it is so powerful and transcendental that the people who make up the planetary uh, protection um, diktat want to make sure it's never seen again because the footprint on the moon represents everything that conservatives believe in, it represents hard work, it represents individual effort, it represents courage, bravery, masculinity, it represents engineering, logic, and science, it represents taking risks, it represents danger, it represents doing things that have never been done before, it represents actual progress instead of the regress that these people want. They want to see us all living in mud huts uh, surrounding our, our burning uh, cow patties and uh, pulling insects off of each other as we raise money for the Guatemalan water snake. Uh, habitat protection program and and that's what they want for us they want they the idea that a footprint on another world even existed in the past and by the way if the ppo had existed during the apollo era the missions wouldn't have flown it would have prevented the missions from flying legally i'm going to read a final quote for you and um and just make a, a final observation this is from the report issued by these um earwig earwig <laughs> boring <laughs> weevils that, that they put in Chekhov's ear with a pair of forceps and, and drills into his brain, the ed, Eddiewigs. Uh, here's their, here's their uh, statement on, on microbial life. Uh, this is the report submitted to NASA. Uh, Even if there is no extant microbial life on Mars or beyond, we must consider the impacts of our actions on geological time skills. They say a human presence on an astrobiologically significant world could disrupt evolutionary processes already in place. Even if there's no extant microbiology going on, it could just suddenly happen, you know. Uh, what moral obligation do we have towards potential future life that our presence on Mars could impact or to hybrid forms of life that our presence could potentially create? These questions must be addressed by planetary protection policy. In other words, the future of humanity must be decided by us meaning those of us in the room. Um, and they close with this. It's worth questioning whether our current mode of extractive capitalism is something that we should take with us with, when interacting with other worlds. Uh, enabling those with the wealth to privately engage in space exploration efforts could exacerbate already extreme wealth inequality in the immediate future. Um, well, now, just to deal with the microbial issue just real fast, we have on Earth, and, and, and have had for millions, hundreds, billions of years, there are pieces of Mars on Earth, there are pieces of the Moon on Earth, there are pieces of Earth on Mars and on the Moon. When these big impacts happen, it spreads it out there. And by the way, I learned to my surprise uh, from this article in, um, in uh, National Review Online, which was written by Robert Zubrin, I learned that, that there, are, there, there are proof that there are not only Martian meteorites on Earth, but that the center of these meteorites never got above 40 degrees Celsius, never even got to sterilization things. So any cross-contamination has been going on forever, but put that aside for a minute. Um, it's one thing to virtue signal yourself to say that I am going to be responsible for everything good that happens in America but you can go bigger than that. It's going to be, be me and my wisdom and my moral superiority that's going to ensure a just and, and safe planet Earth. But you can go even bigger than that. It's going to be me and my sense of moral superiority, my justice, my wisdom and intelligence that's going to provide a safe and secure solar system. But you can go even further than that. It's going to be my sense of wisdom, my moral superiority and my virtue that is going to provide a safe and secure solar system throughout the end of time. And that is where we are with these people. So I will say to them the same thing I would say 
to any other microbes uh, that I might encounter. First of all, I would say you can just eat my hot flaming rocket exhaust on this one. You know, I'm not listening to you. And if we ever did, nothing would ever get done. You can go back and sit in your caves and you can talk about all of these things and how everybody out there is taking stuff that you want to have. If you don't like people mining on the asteroids, you can come up and stop us yourselves. That's where I would start with these people. The second thing I think I would probably say to them is, is, is to the actual microbes. And that's and that's pretty simple. If we find microbial life on Mars or or, or legions or anything like that anywhere. I think we should take great care to make sure that those life forms are preserved and maintained and, and, and kept safe to some degree. Put them in a big, big, big Petri dish. Because my attitude towards uh, microbial uh, elements from Mars or any place else is this. We all started at pretty much the same time, you know. Solar system was created four and a half billion years ago, 4.6 billion years ago. We all got the same start. We're over here visiting you. You're still just generating yeast and methane. <laughs> so you lose. We win. <laughs> we worked harder than you did. And, and, and so it's not like it's anything personal. But honestly, if you're not going to get with the program here, you, you, you barely can even call yourselves life. Um, and that's the attitude that I think that we should all take when going forth into the universe. If the universe is empty of uh, I'm utterly convinced that there's life everywhere and utterly convinced that technological intelligence life is, is, is rarer than you can possibly imagine. Um, but we're going and and we'll take appropriate precautions. But one of the reasons that people like me and Stephen Scott and you watching are so emotionally invested in the idea of space exploration in the first place is for the very, very, very simple subconscious emotional idea that if we could all get on a rocket ship, we could leave these dipshit behind us. <laughs> Wouldn't that be swell? That's what it's all about, folks. That's why science fiction exists. There's the, the dream of leaving these creatures behind. That's your Right Angle brought to you by the paying so members at BillWiddle.com. We've had a, a huge increase in the membership. They're much happier people as a result of it. And if you don't want to join a, on a recurring basis, you don't like recurring credit card payments, don't blame me one bit. Head over to BillWiddle.com. You can make a one-time donation. Many people have. The more that we bring in, the more that we can do. So thank, thank you for those who, uh, who just stepped up in the last couple of weeks. Enormous increase, and, and, and we're going to do big things with it. So thanks especially to our long-term members. Uh, who have been carrying the, the flame and keeping the lights on this whole time. And as for the rest of you, hello, Newman. <laughs> we'll see you next week right here on Right Angle. Right.